Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Vivian Kopsinger Birchall. I'm a cooperator at Emerson Health and a producer at Acton TV. Through my postgraduate studies, I'm passionate about the intersection between medicine and communications. I'm excited to be the moderator for tonight's important discussion, adapting to change as you age, post-hospitalization care, and considerations for seniors. Tonight's event is brought to you in partnership between Emerson Health Community Benefits, the cooperators, and the auxiliary of Emerson Health. One of Emerson's goals as part of Community Benefits a Strategic Implementation Plan is to understand, coordinate, and improve access to available resources and services that help older adults stay healthy and connected to their community with feelings of safety and belonging. Tonight, we'll share some of Emerson's key resources to support the aging population and their caregivers. Tonight's panelists will focus on elements of post-hospitalization care, how to make special accommodations following a hospital stay, how to safely incorporate new medications into a daily regimen, and how to continue to heal at home and prevent rehospitalization. Before we begin, a few housekeeping items. We are recording tonight's webinar and we will send out the recorded link to all those who registered. It will also be available on Emerson's website, so no need to take notes. Tonight's event is in webinar format, which means that you can see us, but we cannot see you. We encourage you to type your questions for our panelists using the Q&A feature on your screen. Questions will be answered at the end of the presentation as time allows. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Kathy Castle. Kathy has been a registered nurse with Emerson Health for the past 15 years. After several years of caring for patients in the orthopedics floor, Kathy spent 11 years as a home care nurse caring for patients in their home setting. In 2020, as COVID made those home visits impossible, Kathy transitioned to the Remote Monitoring Telehealth Program, a program she leads today. She earned her BSN from Northern Eastern, Northeastern University, I beg your pardon. Kathy, over to you. Thank you so much, Vivian, and welcome everyone. Good evening. I'm gonna start my presentation and uh, based on my years in Emerson Home Care and other home cares. And our passion is care in the patient's home and keeping them at home and as safe as possible. Next slide, please. So the first thing when you're in the hospital is to start the question, what is your discharge plan? Are you ready to go immediately home? Are you ready for possibly outpatient rehab? Or do you need uh, more advanced care in the next step? To set up, if you're a provider and you feel that you need um, home health services, Medicare will cover certain in-home services deemed medically necessary. They are requiring intermittent skilled nursing care we offer physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy. In all, order to qualify for home care, typically a patient has to be considered homebound or not strong or safe enough yet to get out on a regular basis. Any patient that's discharging may qualify for these services. And usually you'll have a discussion with the discharging physician or nurse practitioner on what that may look like, and they will send a referral to a home care agency. I encourage people during that hospitalization, which I understand may be stressful, but maybe advocating a family member or friend to start asking questions, start preparing for a successful discharge home. Are there any supplies or adaptive equipment that you may need and who um, would be available to help you for a short-term recovery at home. We also encourage everyone, and you can do this before you would need a hospitalization, is to try and make some 
um, low cost changes to help prevent falls and encourage that successful discharge home. There's simple changes that everyone can make in their home, including um, throw rugs, making sure the home has um, is well lit inside and outside, installing items such as adjustable shower seats, grab bars, handrails, and those are some of the things that can help you adjust to being home and with the focus on safety. Next slide. So from hospital to home, you wanna make sure someone is providing you the right care and support. There's pros and cons with everything in life, including your recovery at home. As a home care nurse and a home care provider, I really do feel and believe that people do heal and recover better in their home. Some of the pros of that is it's a familiar environment. You're comfortable in your home. You could be surrounded by your friends and family to support you. Often I hear everyone sleeps better at home in their own bed, of course, and often you eat better at home. Um, you may try and regain your independence faster at home. That can be a motivating factor because you wanna remain independent at home. And then you also, it allows for a privacy, comfort, and dignity. But some of the questions you really need to be honest with and ask yourself and really need to be considered is do you have that support? Lack of support care, supportive care and assistance can put you at risk for rehospitalization. Do you need home modifications needed? And are they easy to do with a family member assisting you or are they more involved that would require uh, extensive planning? Also keep in mind that your setup may be a little bit more difficult to function and you could be putting yourself at a safety risk. If you don't have the adequate support in the home, isolation is a big factor uh, when you go home and you're by yourself. Also transportation to your post-hospital um, care appointments with your providers ha is, has to be set up as well. Next slide, please. So how do we continue the healing at home? Well, the journey home is different for everyone and there's many options. Will you need continued care at home? Some of the services that can be provided with home health is a nurse, which could help monitor for changes in your medical conditions. We do a lot of teaching for the patient or the caregiver about their care needs. That could include uh, wound care, new diet changes, pain management is a big factor and needs a lot of teaching, medications, which you'll hear more about, and that requires a lot of teaching and a lot of work to manage the medications safely. Sometimes people go home with IV therapy. And then there's also just disease management and prevention. So teaching you the signs and symptoms that may occur that are signaling you for an exacerbation and when to call the doctor. Home health can also provide home physical therapy, which would include home exercise programs. They come in to the home and they they look at your home with a different set of eyes. Um, they'll evaluate for that home safety. They'll have that conversation with you. And their focus is, all of our focus is, but PT will help strengthen you to prevent have that fall prevention. And they'll also assist you with getting those assistive devices to make you safe. They do a lot of strengthening exercises, home walking programs. And then we have our occupational therapies or OT. They're gonna teach you new ways to complete your activities of daily living. So they're gonna focus on your functionality, which includes bathing, dressing yourself safely, meal prep, medication prep, and again, need for assistive devices. Other services home health can provide is our uh, medical social workers, speech and language pathologists, home health aides, and then remote monitoring. Next slide, please. Emerson has partnered with a, um, our vendor and we can provide remote patient monitoring. 
the word remote patient monitoring can mean a lot of different things in a lot of different facilities. For Emerson Home Care, once you qualify for home care and you have either a nurse or a physical therapist or an occupational therapist servicing you in your home, we can decide if we want to do what's called daily monitoring. So one of our nurses will bring out the, a typical kit for um, which it would include a tablet, a scale, a blood pressure cuff, and an oximeter. We will teach you how to use those tools in your home safely. And they're really geared for a certain age population and they're very easy to use. Our targeted population for a lot of our daily monitoring would be our more high acute patients that could have congestive heart failure, chronic lung disease, diabetes, and those sort of things that really we need to have a nurse monitoring you remotely because we're what I say to patients is we're looking for trouble and we hope we don't find it. But if we do, we'll have a discussion with the patient and then help facilitate that communication to the provider to get ahead of any symptom, early symptoms of an exacerbation. Next slide, please. So Emerson's remote patient monitoring, um, the home install process would usually take about 30 to 40 minutes. We're happy to teach the patient or a caregiver how to use the program. And we're assessing for, are you safe to go onto the scale? We will show you how to use the blood pressure cuff. And the items that I do bring out are Bluetooth connected right to the tablet. So they record directly to the tablet. You check your pulse oximeter and within seconds it's recorded to the tablet. And then the nurse that's covering that day will be watching those numbers come in in the morning and reviewing them for any abnormalities. We, our favorite part of our job is to engage with the patient. So we do a lot of follow-up phone calls to check in, see how you're doing. We'll review your symptoms and do uh, teaching and facilitate communication to your provider. We will provide standard of care education and teach the person how to recognize their early symptoms of disease exacerbations and also preventative measures, lifestyle changes, diet, activity, medications. Through the tablet, we also have the ability to use video calls in which we would set up a time to call you and we can see each other, which can provide a more engaging interaction. We can communicate with your provider via phone updates, and we can also fax your data reports to the doctors, which then helps them guide them in their clinical changes and decisions. And we also keep in touch, we help and communicate well with um, your home care team. So maybe you need an extra nursing visit that week, um, et cetera. Next slide, please. One of the biggest things we do within the program is there's, in addition to your blood pressure, your weight, and your oxygen, you'll answer a couple of quick daily symptom changes. So a lot of times when I ask patients, how are you doing today? Everyone will say, I'm fine, I'm okay. But we take a deeper dive into those symptoms. Have you had more short of breath? Have you had more shortness of breath today? Have you had more swelling today? So we're really, showing you how you know these symptoms can arise and then what to do about it. The tablets also provide with us with medication reminders, education videos, and then again, that communication between the home care team and your um, doctor that's providing care for you as well. And I'm gonna just um, also, and we recently just had a discussion about uh, rehospitalization. So there's been many studies that remote patient monitoring can help minimize or prevent decreased rehospitalization. This is a graph on Emerson's remote patient monitoring um, for the past several months, and it has reduced our readmission rehospitalization rate. As a home care team, your nursing, your physical therapists, 
we're assessing you for your risk for rehospitalization and a few things to keep in mind. Have you had any increased falls, two or more falls uh, within the past 12 months? Have you had unintentional weight loss, multiple hospitalizations in the past six months or emergency room visits? Have there been decline in mental or emotional or behavioral status in the past few months? And with also with that, we take into consideration your diagnosis. And so we really are starting that conversation of trying to prevent that rehospitalization right from the beginning of um, home care. There are a few things to go over just as far as things that you could do in your home to look around and see, are there things that could prevent um, falls and then obviously prevent a hospitalizations. Keep in mind stairs and steps, indoors and outdoors. You wanna keep objects off your stairs, fix loose or uneven stairs. Uh, lighting is a big factor for um, walking in and out of your home. Other areas where you'd wanna try and take a look at would be your flooring. Can you, do you have a clear path? So say from your bed to your bathroom or from your bathroom to your kitchen, you wanna remove anything that's in your way to provide you with that clear path. Do you have throw rugs on the floor, which often can be a tripping hazard? Um, wires and cords from lamps are also another hazard to keep in mind and something that you could easily fix and change to help increase your safety. The other areas in your home that you would wanna look at for safety and fixing hazards would be in the kitchen. So are things easy, easy to reach? As we get older, maybe we're using a walker and you wanna make sure that you have the things that you need every day in your reach. Um, in your bedroom, is there lighting near your bed? And again, that path from your bed to your bathroom, is that clear? Bathroom is another issue in homes where you could increase your risk of a fall. So is there a slippery floor? Um, do you need support getting in and out of the tub or um, off the toilet? Could we install grab bars next to the tub or next to the toilet? So these are just some simple things that you can fix on your own, but having home care to come in and assess that situation is also a benefit and can help decrease the rehospitalization rate. All right, thank you, Kathy, uh, for the information on low cost changes at home, post hospitalization, safety tips, and other resources at Emerson. So, thank you again. Um, had you finished before? I, <laughs> I don't want to make a mistake. So anyway, the next our next concern that we're going to be addressing is uh, how seniors can manage additional prescribed medications following a hospital stay. So our next speaker is M Megan Coughlin, who will discuss strategies to safely manage new medications. Megan is a Transitions of Care Clinical Pharmacist at Emerson Health. She joined Emerson Health in 2015 and established the Transitions of Care Pharmacy Service. She works out of the main hospital and meets with patients during inpatient stay to verify what medications they take at home and discuss changes upon discharge. She precepts pharmacy students and residents during their clinical rotations. Dr. Coughlin and her doctor of pharmacy degree from Massachusetts College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences in Boston in 2008. She completed a PGY-1 residency program at Leahy Clinic in 2009 and became a board certified geriatric pharmacist, that is BCGP for those who understand the acronyms in 2017. She has worked in hospital pharmacy since graduating. Her areas of interest include geriatrics, medication safety, and patient education. Over to you, Megan. Thank you, Vivian, for that introduction, and good evening, everyone. Um, as Vivian said, I'd like to talk with you tonight about how best to manage medications after leaving the hospital. Um, so next slide, please. 
Um, and so specifically, I'd like to discuss some common difficulties um, that patients can face to manage medications across different transitions in your care. Um, talk about the importance of a home medication list and how best to manage one. Um, also discuss ways to organize, store, and dispose of medications at home. And as I talk about these things, I'll also talk about some technologies and other supports to help um, you manage these meds in this way. And then lastly, I'd like to talk about who you can contact if any questions or concerns arise um, about your medications after you do return home. Next slide, please. I like this um, picture because I, I think it really um, illustrates well how complicated transitions in our care can be as patients. Um, so in the center, you do see the patient um, and the arrows represent all the many interactions we can have um, for our care. We can be having to go to the hospital, having to go to our doctor's offices, fill our medicines at our pharmacy. Um, as you can see, um, there's some other examples there as well. Um, but at each point, you know, patients, we can be seeing different providers um, and be cared for at different locations. And medications can change at any point um, in this path. Um, and that can really add to the complexity and unfortunately increased risk of um, potential medication errors. Um, as well as readmissions, as Kathy has talked about a bit already. Um, next slide, please. And so a little bit more background information about this is as we all age, um, our need for and use of prescription medications does increase significantly. Um, as you can see here, there are a couple statistics I've listed. 90% um, of us that are 65 years of age or older um, will at least be taking one prescription med um, and a good chunk about almost 36% taking five or more, um, as well as many of the medications taken are over the counter or OTC medications. We also know that um, many hospitalizations are a result of um, something potentially having gone wrong with medications um, and that this can occur four times more often as we get older, older than age 65. Um, there's an increased risk for discrepancies with our medications, um, also drug interactions, um, adverse drug events, whether that's an allergy um, or another adverse effect from a medication, and all of this increases um, with what's known as polypharmacy. Um, and um, of note, a lot of these um, adverse drug reactions are preventable. They actually estimate in the current literature that 25% um, of adverse drug reactions are preventable. Um, so as I said, polypharmacy increases that risk. Um, and so I'd like to talk a little bit more about that. So next slide, please. Um, polypharmacy is defined many ways. Um, but most common you'll see um, is when someone is taking five or more medications um, and about 50% of patients who have uh, Medicare um, are taking five or more medications um, and are also known to have about five or more chronic conditions that we're treating with those medicines. Um, and this um, idea of polypharmacy um, has been studied and has been proven to be an independent risk factor for having a, a hip fracture, um, and also increases the risk for what is known um, as prescribing cascades. And so I'll discuss that further as well. Next slide, please. This is an example of a prescribing cascade. And so you can see our patient, Mrs. Reynolds, um, is known to have um, the condition of depression. So her doctor prescribes the first medication to manage that, which is this bupropion in this example. And then unfortunately, she experiences the side effect of insomnia, and then so that prompts the physicians to recommend that she take something to manage the insomnia, such as sleep ease. Um, and then she has further side effects that you see there, the dry mouth and some constipation and just foggy thinking. Um, and that could, of course, put Mrs. Reynolds at risk for falls, having to come to the hospital, have surgery, et cetera, et cetera. And so we really wanna try to prevent these prescribing cascades from occurring. Next slide, please. Um, some other challenges to manage medications um, could be um, uh, related to a couple of factors, um, one of which could be communication related. Um, unfortunately, despite um, our provider's best efforts, um, sometimes communication can be lacking between, say, your primary care doctor or PCP in the community with some of the specialists you see, which could be at a different um, system. Um, and then of course, if you're admitted to the hospital, 
Um, communication may not be ideal um, between the hospital folks and the outpatient folks caring for you. Um, and oftentimes the hospital could be on a different computer system um, than folks in the community. And so your med list may not match up from place to place. So therefore some information could be inaccurate. Um, some other factors might be what's known as under or over prescribing. Sometimes um, prescribing too little or too much of a dose um, could be um, adding to the challenges to manage um, medication safely. Um, sometimes maybe not the most optimal medication is prescribed. Um, and then lastly, there could also be other barriers to adherence. Um, patients may experience side effects, may not have gotten or felt they have gotten enough education about the medication. Um, some medications are quite costly, brand name only type medications. Um, sometimes if we have vision or hearing loss, memory loss, um, those will all factor our, uh, into our abilities to manage our meds safely and best. Um, sometimes just taking too many medications or having to take medications multiple times per day just really adds to the burden to, to manage them at home. Next slide, please. So given that, I'd like to talk about some strategies for success to manage medicines, especially upon leaving the hospital and returning home. Next slide, please. So before you leave the hospital, there's a couple of important things to consider with your medication. So really you wanna understand your routine um, and ask questions during your stay, as well as at the time of discharge. It's really good to ask the questions kind of from the get-go, once things start to come up, new medicines are being started, even if it's day one of your hospital stay, because um, it can be a lot of information to um, get down and retain, and um, that really might be best. Um, it's good to review the changes and obtain information about, um, especially the new medications, ask for written materials to read regarding these medicines because those can be provided. Um, it's good to also verify, you know, that the medicine is going to be covered by your insurance and that the cost of that will be reasonable for you. Um, also good to confirm the dosages and the timing for when these medicines should be taken and confirm if there's any special instructions for taking them. So some of the common questions you can ask during your stay um, to kind of achieve some of this understanding is, first of all, how do I pronounce this medicine? And what am I taking this for now? And um, are there any um, food requirements or should I take it on an empty stomach? What happens if I forget to take the dose tonight? And what should I expect for side effects? So those are just some common things you can kind of keep written down or tuck away um, with you and, and have at the ready when any new medicine is started for you. Next slide, please. Um, and so the next step is to really think about a home medication list and include all the prescription medicines you're to be taking as well as over the counter. Um, and so what I've done here is, is listed a number of things that your list should include or you should consider that it include. Um, so you wanna of course include the drug name. Um, the formulation is just referring to, is this a tablet? Is this a capsule or a liquid, et cetera? The strength um, is referring to, okay, so this tablet is 20 milligrams. So it's the milligrams of, of each um, tablet you might be taking, uh, but the dose might differ. The dose may be two tablets. And so just kind of noting those details is, is very important so that errors um, aren't made. Um, you also wanna indicate the root and frequency. So do you take this orally? Um, is it an injectable, um, a topical? How often do you take the medication? And then on the right, I've, I've added some additional considerations to put on your list as well. Um, you can tell on the list, you know, what do you take this medicine for? Um, you can also include what um, your allergies or any intolerances are that you've had to medication. Um, so you can list the drug names and you can also say, oh yes, amoxicillin gave me hives last year or something to that effect. Um, it's also really helpful to consider adding um, your pharmacy information. So if the team or doctors caring for you have any additional questions, they know who to reach out for who fills your medicines. And then for folks that might be on some temporary medicines, such as um, a week of antibiotics or two weeks of, say, some steroids, um, I usually advise them to use a calendar to track, you know, when to take each dose and, and when you'll then be done the therapy. So just some helpful tips there. Next slide, please. And this slide just indicates um, a sample template, something you might consider um, to set up your medication list. Um, I know some folks like to put things on the computer at home, use Excel spreadsheets. Um, so it's really whatever's going to work for you um, and then to communicate this information best. Um, so that's one example. 
Next slide, please. Um, so these are just some additional um, important tips for managing your list. So um, when you get home after leaving the hospital, it's really important to compare the list the hospital gave you of what to take to what you normally take at home. And if you notice anything that's amiss, any discrepancies, um, you wanna clarify those with the hospital team or your PCP. Um, and you wanna do so before you resume any of um, the medications that the hospital team wasn't aware of, just to make sure that things will um, be combined safely. Um, of course, you wanna update this medication list anytime changes are made to your regimen. That's probably the most important thing to remember. You can also track the changes of your medicines for your own records. So you can kind of keep a history if you will. And it's really important to communicate any changes made to your medications to anyone who cares for you and especially anyone who prescribes medicine for you. So that way they can account for any potential drug interactions and again, the safety. Um, and um, it's always good to try to consider using one pharmacy if you can. So then your pharmacist filling your meds can also account for that same information and, and check on things for you. So really you wanna, once you have this list, keep it handy, keep it in your wallet, keep it in your purse. Um, I usually tell folks um, to keep a copy on your fridge at home because if God forbid the paramedics need to come and help you out, that's one of the first places they look for this information. And otherwise you might wanna consider giving a copy to someone in your family, a friend or a caregiver so that um, if the team needed to contact them, they would have the information as well. Um, and so just, you know, always review your list for accuracy and you can always contact your local pharmacist or your Emerson pharmacist, such as myself, um, if you need any support or you have any questions. Next slide, please. Um, so this next slide um, is just an example of the file of life. Um, that some folks like to use to keep a copy on the fridge. Um, so that's one example. Next slide, please. Med Action Plan, and I have the website here, is another resource that some folks do use. It can help you track your refills. Um, it can send you reminders to take your medications. Um, you can print a list from here. Next slide, please. And you can use it on a desktop as well as a cell phone um, if you prefer. So just to show some examples of that. Next slide, please. Um, these are a couple of points for organizing your medications. I tell folks to you know, really make it part of your daily routine, something you already do every day. You could consider an alarm clock. Um, you do always wanna make sure that the labels on your bottles from the pharmacy match up to what you're supposed to be taking according to your doctors. If anything looks different, um, call the pharmacy and make sure it's correct. Next slide, please. Um, some other thoughts for organizing your medicines would be using a weekly pill box. There's also blister packing services, um, and there's also medication dispensers. Um, next slide, please. MedMinder is an example, and I do have the website listed here for more information. Um, this is um, an automated pill box. It can um, basically indicate to you with a light as well as some sounds when to take medications um, and it can communicate to your family or caregivers or other loved ones if you've missed a dose. Um, it usually starts around $40 a month for this service um, and it's there's many options to customize. Um, so that's one way of organizing them as well. Next slide, please. Medicine on time is the blister packing option that a lot of pharmacies use. And so you can see they set them up um, in a fashion um, for each um, pocket is what is due each day at a certain time of day. So you would just punch the medicines through there and, and take it that way. So less technology, but still kind of helps support you set them up as they should be taken. Next slide, please. Um, another option is pill pack by Amazon Pharmacy. And so what they do is they package the medicines for a time of day in one little package, as you see there. So they roll it all up in the box for a one month supply. So you just keep tearing off the next little um, unit dosed packet there to take your meds when they're due throughout the day. Next slide, please. And then as I mentioned, dispensers are another option. So the Hero medication dispenser is an option. So basically kind of works like a little vending machine. Um, you can fill it with 90 days of worth of medications, similar to the other systems I've mentioned. Um, it can provide real-time reminders to you when to take your medicines, let you know if you've missed doses, but of course it's a bit more costly. It's about $100 to start up service. Um, I think it's like $45 a month thereafter to maintain it, um, but could be a nice option um, you know, if you want um, 
you know, this um, organization of it versus to the pillow box style. Um, so that's just another option that I wanted to make you aware of. Next slide, please. Um, just a few points on storage, um, just as a reminder, um, if folks aren't already aware, but you really should try to store your medications in a cool, dry place So kind of avoid bathrooms and places where there's a lot of humidity. Um, put them in lock boxes um, if they don't have childproof safety caps on them. And I usually tell folks, keep them somewhere close by um, where you'll remember to take them every day as, as they're due. Next slide, please. I also wanted to give a few points on disposal. So we do have a drug take back bin at Emerson Hospital. So that's the picture I've included there on the right, right in the, um, as you walk into the emergency room. So that is an option. Concord Police also has a drug take back box and also can take sharps. Um, there's also drug take back days in Concord as well as other nearby towns and cities. So you just always wanna look and see what you find. Um, but just a reminder to check your expiration dates on your medications and make sure things are in date so that they'll work most effectively for you. Next slide, please. So just some final thoughts. Um, make sure you ask for help from family, friends, and caregivers if you need it. We can all use a double check with medications. I'm a pharmacist and I sometimes make a mistake with my vitamins and whatnot, so it's always good to take a double check. Um, just really avoid guessing when you're unsure of what to take. Please try to avoid making changes on your own. We don't want that to land you in the hospital with us. And again, if one approach doesn't work to manage them, just contact a pharmacist or another healthcare provider for help. We're always here and we wanna keep you safe and healthy and we'll come up with a, a regimen or a system that works for you. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Uh, new medications can be complex and overwhelming and dangerous if not taken correctly. So thanks for explaining safe protocols for seniors and caregivers. Despite our best efforts, sometimes patients need to be readmitted to the hospital following a procedure or hospital visit. So our next speaker, Melissa DeMarino, will discuss how we can minimize the risk of rehospitalization. Melissa DeMarino is a licensed certified social worker and a certifi certified in disputes resolution or mediation. She graduated from the University of Nevada in Las Vegas, where she received her master's degree in social work with emphasis in direct practice. She has experience in home care, hospice, and palliative care, family counseling to include children and adults, school system social work, behavioral health, and addictions treatment, and has served on disaster action teams with the American Red Cross. Melissa's special clinical interests include case management, resource and referrals, mindfulness-based stress relief, individual group and family brief intervention therapy. Melissa, over to you. Thank you. I hope I'm being heard okay. Uh, this is a section on post-hospitalization care, specifically tips for thriving at home and preventing hospital stays. I am the social worker for both the outpatient rehab department and the home care re rehab. And so I find myself having these discussions every day. Um, as the other two had mentioned before me, smooth transitions um, are required to prevent the return to hospital. So just a quick cap on some of the major reasons that people are readmitted within 30 days is the misinterpretation of discharge information two, inadequate transition of care, and three, condition complications. So I'm going to kind of give a general overview of these top three um, snafus and ways around them to ensure success. So the first one at discharge, again, I think the other two did a great job um, kind of alluding to the need for planning, right? Increasing communication, um, between both the providers, uh, the patients, and then gaining a village, you know, for those second sets of eyes, ears, and um, extra brains to process a lot of the information heading out of a hospital. So consider having a friend or family member join you on your last days as you anticipate discharge. Um, it'll be really important to have discussions that involve some teach back opportunities for you to, again, say out loud back to the providers how you're understanding that information. And that can be crucial so that those providers can catch any lack of understanding, um, misunderstanding, et cetera. So again, um, asking things like what new diagnoses you might have, uh, should you limit any activities? Do you have an 
new recommended diet? Will you need some follow-up tests and treatments, especially post a hospital stay, um, gaining access to transportation and figuring out how you're gonna get to those follow-up appointments is essential. Do you have any new prescriptions or medications that will need refilled? Um, and then what should you do if symptoms do come about again and what, will, what kind of action will you take? Um, after the dust settles, next slide, thank you. After the text, dust settles, it's important to kind of regroup and maybe take stock of some of the uh, paperwork and advanced directives you might have. If you don't have them yet, it's a good time to have those what if talks. So making updates to your advanced directives, making your wishes known uh, ahead of time and appointing healthcare proxies, uh, filling out or considering a MOLST if that applies to you, a medical order for life-sustaining treatment. And just as the file of life that Megan had touched on, those forms are essential to have on your refrigerator as uh, any EMS personnel would be trained to look there first if you have special instructions for them. Um, considering uh, a power of attorney and maybe any estate planning, um, perhaps it will relate to asset mobilization to ensure uh, that you can sustain aging in place or wherever that might take you. So these are difficult talks, but definitely encouraged during the stable time to avoid having to make decisions in a crisis or emotional state of mind. So speaking of tough conversations, I'll add a little bit of flavor to the uncomfortable talks that we all need to get comfortable with. Um, there was a survey taken just last year. Oh, no, this is from 2016. 54% uh, of the people surveyed of the adults in that sandwich generation that have small kids at home um, and also caring for their uh, parents as they age, they say they'd prefer to have that sex talk with their kids than the senior talk um, or, you know, healthcare talk with their aging parents. Um, and so in addressing some of the immediate needs at home, um, the inadequate transitions to care, um, that's really kind of where the rubber meets the road, right? So it's easy if family has taken off time from work, maybe they flew across the US to be with you and ensure your safe landing. Um, and then sometimes we have to start planning for where the sprint in recovery may turn more into a marathon and elongated. So when it comes to this, oh, next slide. <laughs> oh, um, back a slide. <laughs> I'm so sorry, I'm not doing well with that. <laughs> so addressing transitions to add inadequate care. And then next slide. Um, so you want to define and use your village. And, um, so using a certified aging in place specialist, uh, those are also called CAPS. Um, they can be found in the Home Builders Association. Uh, they can survey your home for any potential home modifications to you. Um, back a slide, please. Oh, okay. Um, yes. So Next slide. Uh, next slide. What does community mean to you? So what is it like for you to ask for assistance? Um, check in with some of these questions. Please be specific when offering um, help to a neighbor in need that you know has returned to the hospital from the hospital um, and set expectations from the start. A lot of people feel that they don't know what to ask for. Um, when it comes to asking for help. And so if you're offering to just remind yourself that um, you can always ask them to circle back to you another time when you know when some, what some of your deficits are. Uh, articulating some of the problems and sticking points in your routine can help you define uh, how you need assistance. Um, the quote is, uh, a well-defined problem is half solved. So uh, care for the caregivers in this is so important because role shifts are really tough and everyone deserves support in this. And so acknowledge now that the support you'll need will likely need to go beyond your household. Um, accessing family, friends, uh, people that you've known from colleagues, neighbors, um, they can all be part of your interpersonal support to ensure your success. So no one uh, can live your experience for you, but you don't have to go through it alone. And next slide. Um, 
And again, so tapping into some of those formal resources, such as a certified aging in place specialist, um, accessing your PCP social workers and case managers, um, using maybe a private pay uh, case manager through OASIS, uh, Aging Life Care Association, or Gen by Gen, uh, for example, and maybe a financial planner or senior legal support through the National Association of Elder Law uh, is essential for you to take stock of your assets and prepare for future. Next slide. Some people choose um, to not age in place and maybe access assisted living early on. Um, these can be immensely helpful in that the facility costs uh, to stay there are usually all inclusive and they typically um, support all of the taxes and insurances that go with living space, utilities. Um, they do all the repairs for you. There's no need for standing on ladders to change light bulbs, et cetera. That really minimizes your fall risk. They have a meal plan, um, recreation, dining, entertainment, crafts, et cetera. Um, and so considering this um, and just taking tours and gain, gaining information doesn't mean that you have to um, accept uh, a place when it is offered to you if you do get on some of those lists. But just gathering the information first and maybe putting the feelers out ahead of time can give you some direction um, and maybe a safety net in the event that you need it. Next slide. Some of the health advantages of being in an assisted living, um, again, they can offer some expert and, and medical care if needed. Of course, this will be reactive. Any additional home health aid or personal care attendance would be an additional cost. And that's important to know for assisted living facilities. Um, but there are a lot of social advantages. Um, living through, um, participating in the planned activities and outings such as field trips, dancing, cultural events. Uh, there's a better chance to stay engaged in the living community with people of similar age and dealing with similar issues. Next slide. So as far as aging in place, if you want to be at home, of course, the community also wants you to be at home and honor your goal, right? 70% of the population surveyed in 2022 by AARP, um, adult, senior adults said that they wanted to age at home. And so you're not alone if that is your goal. Next slide. Uh, and if you are going to age in place and do so alone, as you can tell by this graph, even though the print is a little small, you can see that upward trend to people that are aging in place alone. It's on the rise. And so this might create a huge mental shift for you. If you're thinking about that, um, it'll be really important for you to uh, really embrace the concept of the need to check in for your ability to ask for help. It will require people um, to be allowed into your home and into your life more frequently. Next slide. And so on that note, if we age in place um, or in assisted living, and especially if we are alone for any amount of time, it's really important to get ahead of um, safety factors and safety nets, such as personal emergency response systems, um, there's a few noted here, of course, this um, list of uh, lifelines, et cetera, is not exhaustive, but it's important to get to know uh, some of the more reputable companies. There are a few um, less than ideal flyers going around there in advertisements. Um, so be sure and cross check with some of the reputable resources. These do come equipped with the technology for having fall detection, meaning we don't plan how we're going to fall, and in the event we bump our head on the way down, we're not awake to press a button or call anybody, but it will detect the fall and deploy a phone tree that you have personally designed, which is important. It can call friends, neighbors first, et cetera, until it gets the help that you need, um, being EMS if necessary. Um, and it can really increase... Um, confidence and feelings of safety for even loved ones around. Some people have decided, you know, even though they may not feel they need it, um, it helps quiet the what if chatter from their loved ones and that's enough for them. It's important to also remember to please use the lift assist um, non-emergency numbers in your town. If you do have a fall, it's really important to get familiar with that service 
as they can provide the professional and skilled um, assistance for um, getting upright again and tucked in safely, um, more injuries occur statistically as a result of people trying to get up from a fall or a well-intended caregiver trying to assist them up than from the falls themselves, which is a shocking statistic to me. Next slide, please. Um, as far as some of the Massachusetts state funded programs that I often point people in the direction to, you have your councils on aging throughout the towns in Massachusetts. Sometimes these are synonymous with senior centers, sometimes not. Um, they can provide a slew of uh, information and services, transportation, events, et cetera. And then you have your aging service access points. Um, and they have a lot of subsidized funding to uh, offset the cost of some ongoing care in your home, such as the med boxes that Me Megan had touched on or some of those life alert or personal emergency response systems. My mantra for these is know them before you need them. If you need help accessing which uh, aging service access point is in your area, you can look that up on mass.gov. Next slide. Um, I think it's important too to quickly differentiate between home care and home health care. Um, as Kathy had uh, outlined for us beautifully, um, the home health care um, disciplines and um, services, uh, home care often refers to that non-medical entity to include personal care hygiene, eating, incontinence, uh, companionship, meal prep. These are typically private pay entities unless uh, perhaps you can activate a long-term care insurance plan um, and or be assessed through your aging service access point if the state could offset. And that's a means-tested um, assessment, meaning uh, they would take a financial assessment to see what you could qualify for. Whereas the home health care is that skilled entity, it's episodic in nature. It's designed to teach patients and loved ones um, around them. Um, so that they can carry those tips, tricks, and skills going forward. So physical therapy, occupational therapy, as Kathy had mentioned before. Next slide. Uh, number three, then, if your condition, um, condition complications post-discharge, if your condition worsens, what are your contingency plans? Next slide. Um, I think it's important to remind yourself that if you do have a chronic or progressive illness, um, pause and consider accessing early on some of the amazing national resources um, regarding any one of those diagnoses. I think that um, it's easy to um, kind of get lost in the shuffle or our friend Google. And um, just to remember that some of these very, very highly skilled, reputable, knowledgeable um, uh, support systems are in place. Next slide. Um, so the demographic of hospital readmissions, number one is falls, and then those chronic conditions that we spoke about as COPD, diabetes, congestive heart failure, and stroke. Uh, getting our minds wrapped around some of those symptoms, um, just as Kathy had um, outlined through that remote patient monitoring program, is really essential to kind of tracking some of the green lights, yellow lights, and red lights. Next slide. And you'll see an example here of just that color coded, um, you can get a really quick spreadsheet going. Um, it's important to talk about uh, your symptoms with your doctor and then have the ability to kind of categorize them so that you can develop contingency planning. Next slide. So this would be an example of a little bit of a scale for a chronic a COPD patient, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So you've got your all clear symptoms that you're having a great day. Um, some of the warning symptoms, and then the opportunity for you um, to plan around that, right? What will you do? Who will you call? Um, and then the red flag symptoms and how to act fast so that you can kind of be preemptive about that. Next slide. Uh, same thing. I just gave you one more example with the diabetes management tool. Next slide. And so in recapping some contingency planning, rem remember to please keep your options open in an effort to stay in full control of your aging options when your healthcare needs are unpredictable, you should feel empowered to collect information from retirement communities, assisted living facilities, even skilled nursing facilities, as well as private pay caregiving agencies, 
or respite options if you should need them. Um, again, know them before you need them and collect that information um, is gonna help settle and uh, comfort. Seek counsel ahead, do the planning. Again, contingency plans mean that you might even have to write out for yourself, if this happens, then I will. Um, and just really kind of um, put the pen to paper and uh, spell that out for yourself, it'll feel good. When you know what you're eligible for, you will know your options better, right? So applying for appropriate benefits uh, early on, um, maybe talking to your long-term care specialist, uh, if you put funding away for that option um, and how to, when it would be appropriate to uh, engage those services. Um, talk to social workers and get acquainted with your Council on Aging or ASAP, your uh, Aging Service Access Point, or even your Veteran Service Officer. They'll help identify what your options are going forward. Next slide. And so uh, we'll end with a quote of, today is the oldest you've ever been and the youngest you'll ever be. That is one of the lesser known quotes from Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, Mass.gov is just that reminder that it's a beautiful laid out um, state search engine for everything that is governed under the state, um, plugging in things like your aging service access point, and I've listed a few on the bottom there through our Emerson uh, catchment area. Um, you can find ways, um, how to's for applying for disability benefits if that applies to you, um, SNAP benefits, you name it. Emerson has also contracted with an amazing uh, search engine called Find Help. So there is, I think that is actually misspelled. I'm so, I apologize. So it's Emerson Health, H-E-A-L-T-H dot find help dot com. And um, then just search on your town's website for those Council on Aging Senior Centers, et cetera. They have social workers in there that can absolutely point you in the right direction when you're ready to roll up your sleeves and make plans and get connected. And that's all I've got. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Melissa, for giving us tools and strategies to avoid hurry hospitalization and heal safely. Uh, you, you, because we're, we've run out of time, I most of, I've seen we have a few questions. I can't uh, read out all of them, but Melissa has answered many of them. I took, they were mostly concerned about where to find services. I think uh, Melissa has mentioned that and uh, questions about how to help to make parents and seniors comply with safety tips. So perhaps the Emerson team can write up something and then send out to all, you know, some of these answers to all the people who registered for, uh, for this webinar. But really, for, we, for now, I just want to say we've run out of time, but it's been an amazing evening. Uh, that is all we have for this evening. And I'd like to thank our panelists and guests for joining us to discuss this important topic. Please look for a follow-up email with a recording of tonight's presentation. We hope that you enjoyed tonight's discussion and hope that you might join Emerson again at a future event. Good night and thank you.